Hi folks, so I've already put a video up about the cavalry carbine here, the 1844 pattern, uh, this one being tower marked to 1859. So this is a British cavalry carbine, they were also issued to Indian soldiers and, and other soldiers in essentially in the British Empire at that point. Um, and they are short, not very accurate, not very long range, um, but they're good at basically pouring lead into an opponent that you've ridden up relatively close to, bang, and then ride off again. However, they, uh, short guns like this were used occasionally by people on foot. And I'm really just going to use this. This is a cavalry carbine, but I'm going to use this for demonstration purposes. So, for example, rifles. If we look at the Baker rifle and the Brunswick rifle, they're relatively short. And because they're relatively short, they're not particularly good as hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons. Obviously, someone with a musket has a bayonet fitted to the end. Whilst the majority of um, infantry have a long musket with a spike bayonet on the end, that becomes a pole weapon of about manhide. However, for people who are using rifles or carbines, there is not an awful lot of point in putting a bayonet on the end, because what you end up with is a very short weapon. And if we, if we look at the reach of a sword, well, just... Uh, grab this sword off the wall here, there we go. So if we look at the reach of a sword, the problem is a sword blade is about the length of a person's arm and that means if you're trying to use a bayonet attached to something like this and someone's attacking you with a sword, you're just going to get your hands and arms chopped up because you don't have enough reach to keep them at bay. Now one way that uh, is recommended to hold muskets for example, that Anthony Gordon does, is he actually moves the hand down to here or around this point and he actually puts the hand on the butt. That's right, he liked the hand on the butt. And uh, that, what that gives you is longer reach. It means that you can essentially use the thing a bit more like a, it's held like almost like a pike um, at the starting position. But when you actually lunge out, you've got a lot more reach. So if the opponents are only using their bayonets like that, you can outreach them by moving your hands six inches backwards, essentially. Okay, which is a, a, can be a useful thing. What you lose in doing that is that you lose um, fine control. You can thrust and you can slip, but you can't control the thing anywhere near as well as if you did this. Okay, So actually in later bayonet sources it becomes more popular to hold it in this conventional way here. Very occasionally they move the back hand a bit further down and they move the hands a bit back, but they essentially keep the hands closer up to the firing position. Now, if you're using a short rifle or a short carbine, you don't have that reach. You, you've got a very short reach, so you have to compensate for that in some way. And one way that they sometimes did it was by fitting a sword bayonet. So if you look at the Baker sword bayonet, or indeed the later, uh, the Enfield carbine uh, um, Yatagan bayonet, or the Martini Henry carbine Yatagan bayonet, they are long bayonets that are compensating for the short length of the carbine. I should mention also that sailors, uh, the Royal Navy, used shorter versions uh, than the standard muskets. So, people who were issued with shorter firearms were very often issued with longer bayonets to compensate for it. Um, sailors, sergeants sometimes carried shorter versions, um, and of course riflemen, the rifles were often shorter than muskets of the same period, certainly in the Napoleonic era that's true. Um, however there are other exceptions of people who used short firearms in close combat and they were essentially used in two ways. Now two examples of people who used short firearms in close combat in a different way were uh, for example American militia and revolutionaries often uh, didn't fix bayonets, they didn't like fighting in that type of fight, they were more guerrilla fighters, more mobile and knew that they didn't stand a very good chance going bayonet to bayonet in straight lines against British forces for example in the Revolutionary War um, and that wasn't always true, they did, they did sometimes fight like that but uh, the, the guerrilla forces didn't obviously want to get into that type of fighting so what they tended to do with their shotguns or short rifles, Hawken type rifles and things like this which you couldn't fit a bayonet to anyway uh, because they didn't have a bayonet lug on them is they actually used them in the left hand and another group of people who did this were the Gurkhas. Now Gurkhas famously use a cookery. Okay, a cookery is one of these lovely things, one of my favourite type of knives now the Gurkhas famously, um, they did use bayonets fixed to their muskets or rifles, but they did also famously use these two things together, 
and they use them, interestingly, in it pretty much exactly the same way as is shown in American militia manuals of the early 19th century. And that is, your short firearm, even if it's a full-length musket actually, you hold in your left hand, and it's a shield, okay? It's essentially a parrying stick. And it's a very effective one, because it's got a lot of weight to it. So if someone swings a sword at you, you can put the thing, as long as you don't put your hand in the way, you can put the barrel or the butt in the way to block while you attack with your Bowie knife in the case of uh, the American Militia Manual or Kukri in the case of the Gurkhas. So you've essentially got a, par you've got a shield, a parrying stick in one hand and a knife or dagger in the other hand. Okay, brilliant combination. Um, and the other thing to mention about it is it works pretty well against bayonets or spears. Remember that bayonets and spears tend to be linear in their attacks. Yes, they can, if we pretend I've got a bayonet in here, you can thrust from above or below, you can sort of thrust from this side, but usually thrusts are either given up the middle, from low and upwards, or from high and downwards, like this. Okay? But the attacks are fairly linear, as you can see in the camera, it's coming straight towards you. Now, if you're dealing with fairly linear attacks, whether they come high or low, a stick is quite a good thing to have, and this goes all the way back to medieval treatises. If we look at Fiore de Liberi in 1410, he uses a stick to defend against a spear thrust and then attack with a dagger. It's the same thing. If across, um, across several centuries, we've got essentially the same technique. So if you've got cookery and parrying stick, in this case your firearm which you've discharged at the enemy and it's now unloaded, you don't have time to reload, you've now coming up against someone with a bayonet, all you essentially need to do is get the uh, parrying stick to one side and judge the timing and distance to correct and as they thrust, you push the thrust off to one side so as they thrust in, boop, you push the point off to the side charge in and attack either their arms or their head or whatever with your knife or your cookery um, and it can go the other direction you can of course start with it this side if the thrust comes in here now you push, you push the point offline as you close in here and attack and for any of you who've watched our videos about sword and shield or spear and shield, you'll see that these techniques are essentially the same. It's the same principle whether you're using a shield and closing this line and opening this up and attacking into it, or closing this line and opening this line and attacking it, you can do it to either side. And because this object is long, as long as a shield in fact, it's very good against the bayonets that will go high and low. So if they faint high and then thrust low, or faint low and thrust high, you can still catch it fairly easily because you've got a long, long extension above and below the hand. The final thing to say about this combination is it was done historically, it was done over a wide period of time, and the techniques are basic, easy to learn, and are effective against ba both bayonets and spears. And what I would say is that, um, in actual fact, in modern warfare, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat doesn't happen very often. but Many of the modern firearms that are used, certainly by Western forces, if we look at the M4 carbine, if we look at the British SA-80, uh, even the Stur Aug, things like this, they are relatively short firearms, and they can have bayonets fitted on them, at least the British one can. Um, but when you fitted the bayonet on an SA-80, because it's a bullpup arrangement and you've got the magazine behind your um, trigger hand, um, you don't have very much extension in front of you here and your bayonet is very close to you. This means that someone attacking you with a knife can quite easily both uh, tackle or come in contact with this at the same time as stabbing you because of the reach of their arm. The reach of their arm is as long as your extension. And so I think it's wrong to put a short bayonet on a short firearm. If you're dealing with a short firearm you should separate the knife or bayonet from the carbine and you should use the carbine in the left hand to aid defence and then you've got your bayonet or knife in the other hand for offence. So I think that if we were looking at modern uh, use of the hand weapons that are issued to modern western militaries we should be looking at what the Gurkhas and what the American militias used to do in the 19th century. We shouldn't be thinking about traditional bayonet fighting. Cheers guys! Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.